Today on Living Power. How can you turn back again to the weak and worthless elementary principles of the world whose slaves you want to be once more? Are you nuts? It doesn't say are you nuts, but you know, but it should. Um, you see, the point being this, when you get to know God, it changes your life completely, and you either know God or you're a slave to the ways of the world. Bringing God the Glory, Live for God Studio Productions. This is Living Power with Dan Hurst. Uh, let's have a word of prayer and we'll get started in, in our study. Father, thank you for the privilege that we have to, to study your word. God, it's so great to just see you and to see your love for us and your, your, your desire to connect with us and commune with us and, and work through us as we allow you to. Father, I pray that you would anoint this, this study uh, in Exodus. Give us insight to ourselves and to you and to what you want from us and how you want to apply these things in our lives. Uh, Lord, for these concerns, these medical concerns that we've shared and for others that, that go unshared, I pray, Lord, that you would work in people's lives. May they sense you and, and know, know you in a very, very real and personal way and understand that you love them and uh, you're up to something in their lives, even, even during these difficult times. So, Father, we entrust them to you, and we entrust ourselves to you as we study your word now. In Jesus' name, amen. Uh, we are going to, for the next, uh, I imagine, a uh, couple of years, um, take, a, I mean, it took them 40 years to get through the desert, you know. It, it says it can't take that long to study it. Uh, but uh, we're going to walk with the, uh, with the Israelites in their journey to freedom from Egypt to the land of promise. So we'll be studying the book of Exodus. And uh, uh, it, it, Beth wanted to know if, if uh, we're going to do show and tell, and I'll bring in the tablets. And I might. I don't know. I might. I keep them up in the attic. So I might need some help getting them down with, with my age. Um, by the way, whoever invented those those steps that come down out of the garage, you know, they climb up. Yeah, yeah. Whoever did that apparently didn't know that there are fat boys in the world, <laughs> and uh, and and they're narrow. You know that you know. So you can you can hurt yourself on those things. Anyway, um, as 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 we go in our study in Exodus, we're going to discover some of the most amazing practical, applicable truths of, of God's Word. I, I think it's just going to surprise you. We're going to discover what it means to really trust God. We're going to discover the power of faith. We're going to discover uh, the destruction that disobedience brings. We're going to discover the blessing of obedience. Um, we're going to discover that God is a deliverer, a protector, a provider. We're going to discover what it really means to be a child of God. All of that's in Exodus. It's going to be a, a pretty amazing study, I think. Exodus is the second book of what we call the Pentateuch, which is the first five books of the Bible. The name Exodus actually has Greek origin, uh, and, and the word literally means in the Greek, exit or departure. And, and the, the passage of Exodus, the book of Exodus, starts this way with verse 1, Exodus 1. These are the names of the sons of Israel who came to Egypt with Jacob, each with his household, Reuben, Simeon, Levi, and Judah, Issachar, Zebulun, and Benjamin, Dan, and Naphtali, Gad, and Asher. All the descendants of Jacob were 70 persons. Joseph was already in Egypt. And that's how Exodus begins. Now, the Hebrew name for this book of Exodus is, is actually comes from the first few words of the text, and it, 
it literally says in Hebrew, and these are the names of, and it goes on like what we just read. And the, uh, the, that is the title of the book for them. Sometimes they just call it the Shema. But it, the, the, the idea is that in Hebrew, it begins with a conjunction. It says, and these are the names of the sons of Israel and so forth and so on. And the word and suggests that the book of Exodus was actually intended to be a continuation of the book of Genesis. That's why it starts with and. So you think of Genesis and Exodus actually hand in hand. They belong to each other. And these first five verses that we just read clarify the circumstances which uh, the Jews were in in, uh, in Egypt. Remember that Joseph had been sold into slavery by his brothers uh, because they were jealous of him. And uh, he became a central part of the Egyptian government. God blessed him uh, as, he, as he waited on the Lord and let God protect him and lead him. And so he became uh, essentially prime minister of Egypt. And when a severe famine hit the land, he had already prepared them for that. And uh, they were ready to survive during that time. And the rest of Joseph's estranged family, not knowing what had happened to Joseph, uh, they had heard that there was food in Egypt, and so they went looking for it. And at first, when they were there, they didn't recognize Joseph. They had an encounter with him. They didn't recognize him. But when Joseph revealed himself to them, uh, there was a reconciliation, a family reconciliation. It's recorded in uh, Genesis chapter 50. And this is what Joseph said to them in Genesis 50, starting with verse 20. As for you, you meant evil against me, but God meant it for good to bring it about that many people should be kept alive as they are today. So do not fear. I will provide for you and your little ones. Thus he comforted them and spoke kindly to them. So Joseph remained in Egypt. He and his father's house, Joseph lived 110 years. So that's what has happened in Jerusalem, that, that transition from Genesis to Exodus. And so we're going to pick up with the narrative in Exodus with verse 6. And here's the story. Then Joseph died and all his brothers and all that generation. But the people of Israel were fruitful and increased greatly. They multiplied and grew exceedingly strong so that the land was filled with them. Talking about Egypt. Now there arose a new king over Egypt who did not know Joseph. And he said to his people, Behold, the people of Israel are too many and too mighty for us. Come, let us deal shrewdly with them, lest they multiply. And if war breaks out, they join our enemies and fight against us and escape from the land. Therefore they set taskmasters over them to afflict them with heavy burdens. They built for Pharaoh stores, cities, Pithom, and Ramses. But the more they were oppressed, the more they multiplied. And the more they spread abroad, and the Egyptians were in dread of the people of Israel. So they ruthlessly made the people of Israel work as slaves and made their lives bitter with hard service in mortar and brick and in all kinds of work in the field. In all their work, they ruthlessly made them work as slaves. Then the king of Egypt said to the Hebrew midwives, one of whom was named Shipra and the other Pua, when you serve as midwife to the Hebrew women and see them on the birth stool, if it is a son, you shall kill him. But if it, if it is a daughter, she shall live. But the midwives feared God and did not do as the king of Egypt commanded them, but let the male children live. So the king of Egypt called the midwives and said to them, why have you done this and let the male children live? And the midwives said to Pharaoh, because the Hebrew women are not like the Egyptian women for they are vigorous and give birth before the midwife comes to them. So God dealt well with the midwives, and the people multiplied and grew very strong. And because the midwives feared God, he gave them families. Then Pharaoh commanded all his people, Every son that is born to the Hebrews you shall cast into the Nile, that you shall let every daughter live. Now, Exodus, or the story of Exodus, begins with captivity. All journeys to freedom begin with captivity, obviously. And sometimes when we take a look at our own lives, we don't even know that we're captives. 
We're just, we're dealing with some issues in our life and we're captive to some of those issues. And we don't really completely understand it. Sometimes we don't even know. It's just a, a way of life for us. We may know that there's a better way, but we've learned to cope with our circumstances. And we live our lives coping with our circumstances. We've settled for survival. So we're not sure what to think then when we read, for example, in the New Testament, something that Jesus said in John 10, 10, the thief comes only to steal and kill and destroy. I came that they may have life and have it abundantly. And so we struggle with that. You know, we're just, we're, we're in survival mode dealing with the things in our life, the issues in our life, the struggles in our life, the things that we have to face day to day to day to day. And now Jesus says, I want you to have abundant life. And it just doesn't quite connect with us. We're used to dealing with loss and failure and death and destruction. We're used to the fact that life just isn't easy, is it? I mean, life is not easy. We're used to that way of life. We're used to settling for survival. And when Jesus said that he came so that we can have life and have it abundantly, we don't really know what to do with that. Because to us, it's it, it. we can't comprehend it. To us, it's just theory. Jesus says, I've come that you might have abundant life. We're going, oh yeah, that's nice. But we don't really, really... Somebody's outside waiting for us. Who is it? <laughs> Who has a phone that has a honk? That's the funniest thing. <laughs> anyway, we don't know what to do with, with that teaching from Jesus. All right, if you want me to have abundant life, then where's the abundance? You know, I, and I'm just tr trying to get one foot in front of the other every day. I'm just surviving. And then we read in 1 Corinthians, 1 Corinthians 2, 9, No eye has seen, no ear has heard, and no mind has imagined what God has prepared for those who love him. And you know what our response is to that? We agree. We can't imagine it. We can't conceive it. You know, to, to, to us, it just doesn't completely make sense. It, it's, it's difficult for us to believe that God really does have something better for us. We hope it's true, but so far it isn't for many believers. We're just going through the motions. And we think we're going through the motions in a better way because we know the Lord and we know, hey, someday we're going to be living in heaven. And things are going to be okay. But the fact of the matter is we're just surviving. Most people and most Christians are just going through life surviving. And then we read in Ephesians, Ephesians 3.20, Now to him who is able to do far more abundantly than all we ask or think, according to the power at work within us, to him be glory in the church and in Christ Jesus throughout all generations forever and ever. Amen. And we go, oh, amen. That's great. But that first line catches us and trips us up. Him who is able to do far more abundantly than all we ask or think. That one we just kind of go, uh, uh, okay. But it's not real in our lives, is it? For many people, it's just not real in our lives. We know that there's more out there. We just don't know how to connect with it. And we just nod our heads and we say, look, I want to believe that. I really do want to believe that. But I don't get it. I don't get it. It all seems so pie in the sky. You know what I'm saying? It's just like, yeah, it's there, but it's all so beyond us. It's just not my reality. It's just all so theoretical. And so we live our Christian life in theory. This is the way it's supposed to be. This is the way we've been told. And we study the Bible and we see these passages in the scripture and we go, uh-huh, uh-huh, I believe it. Well, let me rephrase that. I want to believe it. But so far, I haven't really seen it in my own life. Maybe a little bit. I've seen it in other people's lives, but not really in my life. And so we settle for survival. And that's where the Jews were in Egypt. 
They had settled for survival. I want you to pick up on some of the words and phrases in this account that we just read and see if you can identify with what was going on. Verse 10, let us deal shrewdly with them. Verse 11, they set taskmasters over them to afflict them with heavy burden. Verse 12, they were oppressed. Verse 13, they ruthlessly made the people of Israel work as slaves. Verse 14, they made their lives bitter with hard service. Also in verse 14, in all their work, they ruthlessly made them work as slaves. And then in verse 16, it says they were told to start killing each other. Well, that's a struggle. (laughs) When you're living in that kind of oppression, all you can do is just barely survive from day to day to day. And then it becomes like, how do I survive? And your focus isn't on abundant life. Your focus is on not getting killed. And you know what? A lot of people are living their lives like that today. You know, not looking, you know, I know abundance is out there, but right now I'm just trying to put one foot in front of the other. I'm trying to survive. The Jews were in Egypt for over 400 years. And this, what we're looking at, describes their life for about half of that, around 200 years. This was just their way of life. They were going through this on a day by day by day by day by day basis. There's no abundant life there. There was nothing abundant about it. Let me ask you something. Are the difficulties in your life, the pressures, the stress, the oppression, are those things just a way of life for you? You're not alone if that's you. Because most of the people in this room would have to agree, it's just kind of a way of life for me. This is what I'm dealing with. Some days worse than others. But it's a struggle. I'm just trying to survive. And what you find is that you're captive to a way of life that you just can't break out of. You're captive. And you don't know how to get out of that kind of a lifestyle. I'll tell you what you need. You need a journey to freedom. You need an exodus. But I want you to understand this. The journey to freedom begins when you start to understand your captivity and what it's doing to you. Your journey to freedom will begin when you start to understand your captivity and what it's doing to you. You know it's hurting. You know you're struggling. You know it's difficult. But you're never going to be set free until you really understand your captivity and what it's doing to you. So let me ask you this. What will it take for you to decide that you're not going to be captive anymore? What will it take? What will it take for you to decide that you are not going to settle for survival anymore? What will it take for you to finally decide that this way of life is not acceptable? This is not the way it's supposed to be. And God, if all of those things in the Bible are true, that Jesus came to give me abundant life, and all those other verses that that the guy just read, if they're true, then the way I'm living is just not acceptable. I need more. I want more. What is it going to take for you to say you are no longer going to be captive of your circumstances? To finally look at your circumstances and say, okay, that's it. I'm not going to be a cap. I'm not going to be captive to this. I'm not going to be a prisoner of my own life. What you need is an exodus. And an exodus starts with one step. The first step to freedom. The first step to freedom is found in verses 16 and 17. It's found with what the king said to the Hebrew midwives. 
The king said to him, or the Pharaoh said to them, when you serve as midwife to the Hebrew women and see them on the birth stool, if it is a son, you shall kill him. But if it is a daughter, she shall live. But the midwives feared God and did not do as the king of Egypt commanded them, but let the male children live. Now here is the first step of freedom. It's in that little phrase, but the midwives feared God. You see, Apparently, from reading this verse, fearing God produces choices based on your fearing. That's what they did. They feared God, and so they decided they were going to do as the king was telling them to do, and they let the children live. Their fear, not of Pharaoh, but of God, caused them to do that. So apparently, this idea of fearing is important because God produces choices based on your fear. God produces choices in your life, and you make choices in your life based on your fear. Now, let's really focus on that term, fear God, because whatever, listen to this, whatever you fear controls you. Whatever you fear controls you. If you fear death, believe me, you're going to do everything you can to stay alive. If you fear snakes, you don't go walking through the woods. You know, whatever you fear controls you. Now, the word fear, uh, it's yare. Uh, The word fear means to be afraid. (laughs) No, really, I'm giving that one to you for free. Uh, The word fear means to be afraid. You might want to write that down. I don't know. It's a pretty good note. But listen to this. It's the motivation behind the fear that makes all the difference. You get that? It's the motivation behind your fear that makes all the difference. You see, if one is afraid of God because they think he's angry and or, or he's vengeful uh, and that he's Going, there's going to be some retribution if you do something like God's over with a big old hammer and he's just going to whack you if you do something wrong. If that's your concept, if you fear God that way, then that negative fear will dominate your relationship with God. And there are a lot of people in the world who do fear God that way. They're just afraid that if they, if they insult God that he'll whack them, which is a good Hebrew word, whack them. And they're just afraid to live their life, you know, because they think that God, they don't want to make God mad, because if they do, he'll smite them. But if one gets to know God and is afraid because they are awed and they revere God and they want God to be pleased with them, then that's what will dominate one's relationship with God. You see, listen to this, knowing God, knowing God produces an awe and reverence for him. So there are two ways to fear God, the negative way where you're afraid of God, that he's going to do something to hurt you, or you know God, and so you don't want to do anything to offend him because you love him. It's the motivation behind the fear that we're talking about here. You see, at the foundation of freedom, real freedom, begin is, is this sense of awe of God. That's where freedom begins. It begins with this first step of freedom that there you have an awe for God. That you revere him so much that it's somewhat frightening because you realize, hey, this relationship with God, it's real. You know, it's, it's, it's life changing. I'm connected with God. And when you suddenly realize that you in the entire cosmos are one of those people that really has a relationship with God, that's intimidating. You know, it's not just the happy go lucky, oh, Jesus loves me. This I know. But rather, my God loves me. And I love him. Who could say that? It's just an amazing relationship. And what you fear is not God, but a fear of offending him because he's so awesome. And you don't want to hurt him because you love him. 
That's a different kind of fear. That's awe and reverence. Let me give you an example of what I'm talking about. It's in Isaiah. Isaiah chapter 6, starting with verse 1. In the year that King Uzziah died, I saw the Lord sitting upon a throne, high and lifted up, and the train of his robe filled the temple. And above him stood the seraphim. Each had six wings. With two he covered his face, and with two he covered his feet, and with two he flew. And one called to another and said, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is full of his glory. And the foundations of the thresholds shook at the voice of him who called, and the house was filled with smoke. And I said, Woe is me. I'm lost. I'm a man of unclean lips, and I dwell in the midst of a people of unclean lips. For my eyes have seen the King, the Lord of hosts. That is all and reference. See, that's not being afraid of God that God's going to smack you. But that's just being so overwhelmed by the immensity and the greatness of God. When you catch a glimpse of the immensity and greatness of God, that produces a reverent fear of him. A fear that you might offend him. A fear that you might insult him. Not a fear that you're going to get hurt in the process. Not that. A fear that you don't want to do anything that displeases him because you honor him and you want him to be pleased. You know, it's like this. Some of you have grandchildren. Uh, and every grandparent thinks that their grandchild is the best, right? And, uh, and, and, you know, you're entitled to be wrong. <laughs> and you love that child so much that you don't want to do anything to hurt that child. Now, you're not afraid to say no to that child because you know it may be in their best interest. But more importantly, you don't want to do anything that hurts the child. And that's the way it is with what I'm talking about. You love God so much that you don't want to do anything to hurt God. You don't want God to be sad with you, to put it in a very immature way of, of looking at it. So that's what this, that's what this is talking about. That there has to, the first step to freedom is to have that kind of a connection with God where you see him in his, and he's high and lifted up and he's this great God who loves you and you have a connection with him and you don't want to do anything to offend him because you love him. So how does that happen? Where does that start? Well, Jesus said it this way in John chapter 8, starting with verse 31. Jesus said to the Jews who had believed him, If you abide in my word, you are truly my disciples. And you will know the truth, and the truth will set you free. First step to freedom. Know the word. Get into the word. The first step to freedom happens as you get to know God. And that begins with studying God. And that begins with the Word of God, because as we study the Word of God, we gain understanding of God, which, by the way, is the only real legitimate reason for studying the Bible. It's not legitimate to study the Bible for history, even though history exists in the Bible. It's not legitimate to study the Bible for science, even though science exists, or for math. You know, all of these other reasons, or for just the beauty of, of, of the, the, the writing, the literary value of it, those are all good reasons, but they're not the legitimate reason for studying the Word of God. You study the Word of God to know God. That's And when you study it, you have to study it from that standpoint. What does this reveal to me about God, about His nature, about His character, about His love? 1 John 5, 20, one of my favorite verses in the Bible says this, and we know that the Son of God has come and has given us understanding the Son of God has given us understanding so that we may know Him who is true. And we're in Him who is true. In His Son, Jesus Christ, He is the true God and eternal life. By the way, there are a lot of religions, a lot of denominations that don't believe that Jesus is God. 
I don't know what to do with this verse. Because this verse says that he is. He is God. If you have any Jehovah's Witnesses, friends, ask them to look up 1 John 5.20 in their Bible and see what it says. It kind of confuses them. Um, the Apostle Paul warned that either you know God or you are a slave to the ways of the world. You either know God or you're a slave to the ways of the world. Galatians 4, verse 8, Formerly, when you did not know God, you were enslaved to those that by nature are not gods. But now that you have come to know God, or rather be known by God, how can you turn back again to the weak and worthless elementary principles of the world whose slaves you want to be once more? Are you nuts? That doesn't say are you nuts, but you know, but it should. Um, you see, the point being this, when you get to know God, it changes your life completely. And you either know God or you're a slave to the ways of the world. The first step to freedom is to know God. And the more you get to know him, the more focused you are on him. Which brings us to the second step to freedom. The second step to freedom is one that you've probably never thought of. This is going to blow some of your minds. Um, it's in Exodus chapter six, uh, chapter 1. Verses 21 and 22, specifically. And we already looked at it. And because the midwives feared God, he gave them families. Then Pharaoh commanded all his people, every son that is born to the Hebrews, you shall cast into the Nile, but you shall let every daughter live. Now that had to be a little disheartening to these midwives. They'd been told to kill all the boys, and they didn't do it. So now the Pharaoh comes back and he tells his people, Tells all the Egyptians, you see a Hebrew boy, throw him into the Nile. By the way, the Nile was was fraught with crocodiles, and uh, uh, it was it was it was a, it was sudden death essentially to throw a baby into the Nile. But here's the reason that he said it, because Pharaoh feared the captive Jews. He was afraid of them. They were expanding. They were multiplying, and he was afraid that. They would rebel and come against him. He was fearing an overthrow. There were so many of them, and they had this. The only way I can describe it, he would say, is like, it's kind of like a hidden power. And it's called God. And, and, and Pharaoh needed to do something to control them. So he ordered the death of all newborn baby boys. It was genocide. If he could control the growth of the Jewish population then he could control the Jews. Now listen to this. He feared them. Pharaoh was afraid of the Jews. Now listen to this. The second step to freedom is to understand this. In your captivity, whatever you're captive to, in your captivity, you are a threat to the one who is holding you captive. In your captivity, you are a threat to the one who is holding you captive. Let me explain it this way. You're a threat to Satan. You are a threat to Satan. And he will do anything he can to hold you submissive. If he's holding you submissive by alcoholism or inappropriate sexual behavior or pornography or low self-worth or an abusive relationship or financial failure or despair, no matter how Satan is holding you captive, it's because you are a threat to him. He's not doing it to be mean. He's doing it to control you because you are a threat to him. 2 Peter 2.19 says this, the prom they, speaking of the world, they promise them freedom, but they themselves are slaves of corruption. And get this, for whatever overcomes a person, to that he is enslaved. So Satan knows that if he can overcome you with whatever it is you're captive to, that you're enslaved. Because he fears you. You're a threat to him. So this is an important step to freedom. Recognize your captivity. 
and understand why you are captive. You are a threat to the one who holds you captive. This is life changing. This will, this will break the bonds, the chains in your life that you've been struggling with. But how do you break free? How do you break free? How do you, get this, I love this term. How do you fulfill the threat? Okay, Satan, you're afraid of me? <laughs> I'm going to give you a reason to be afraid of me. I'm going to fulfill the threat. How do you, but how do you break free? Listen, I want to live my life in such a way that in the morning when I wake up, Satan goes, uh-oh. I want to live that way. I want to live my, my life free in Christ. I want to live my life free from the, from the things that Satan would do to hold me captive, to keep me down because I am a threat to him. I want to live that way. So it's important that you fulfill the threat that you are to your captor. And how does a slave break free? I want to give you two verses that answer that. First of all, Galatians 5.13. For you were called to freedom, brothers. Only do not use your freedom as an opportunity for the flesh, but through love, serve one another. And then 1 Peter 2.16. Live as people who are free, not using your freedom as a cover-up for evil, but living as servants of God. So to answer your questions, how do you break free? How do you fulfill the threat that you are to your captor? How does the slave break free? Here's the answer. You become a slave to someone else. You become a servant of God. You see, instead of being a slave to Satan, you become a slave to God. You make that choice. You decide, I'm going to serve God. I'm no longer going to serve Satan's wishes and his demands on my life. I'm not going to do it. I'm going to serve God. Your focus must change from being captive to serving God. Therein lies freedom. You have to make this conscious choice that I am no longer going to be captive to the ways of the devil, but I am going to start being captive to God. I'm going to start serving God. I'm not going to serve Satan anymore. I'm going to serve God. Galatians 3.23 says this, Now before faith came, we were held captive. Before, get that little phrase, before faith came, you were held captive. So what does that tell you? How you break free? Well, you were held imprisoned until the coming faith would be revealed. There it is, folks. Faith is the impetus to free you from your captivity. Faith is the impetus to free you from your captivity. And so what is faith? You know this. You've heard it a hundred times, maybe more. A hundred times. Look at this. Trusting obedience to the known will of God. That's faith. It's not stepping out of the dark saying, man, I hope this is what God wants me to do. No, faith is doing what you know God wants you to do. Just being obedient to him. Faith is trusting obedience to the known will of God. And when you begin to trustingly obey what you know is God's will, by the way, don't worry about what you don't know. When God wants you to know it, he'll make sure you know it. But when you begin to trustingly obey what you do know is God's will for your life, you will begin to move from slavery to freedom, freedom in Christ. No longer under the captivity of the devil. No longer under the slavery of the world. But under the freedom of Christ. Galatians 5.1 says it this way. For freedom, Christ has set us free. God wants you to be free because freedom is the way of life that God chooses for you. And in that freedom, in that freedom is where you find all of those things, that abundant life that Jesus was talking about. But you can't enjoy abundant life if you're being held captive. You just can't. Until you are set free from that, you will not know it. It will just be theory to you. 
But when you're free in Christ, Jesus says that you'll be free indeed. And it was for freedom that Christ has set us free. Stand, therefore, and do not submit again to the yoke of slavery. That's a choice you make. I'm not going to do it anymore. I've had it. I'm not going to be captive to the way of the world. I'm not going to be captive to the devil. I'm not going to be captive. I'm going to be free in Christ. So if you sense that you're a captive, that you're captive to your own sin or someone else's sin, maybe you may be captive to somebody else's sin, recognize, and boy, this is so life-changing, recognize that you, you are a threat to the one who holds you captive. You're a threat to the one who holds you captive. And by trustingly obeying the known will of God, you will begin to loosen the bonds of captivity and begin to walk in the freedom of serving God. Questions, comments, criticisms, complaints. You have the floor. Anybody? Nobody? You went first. Okay, the second comment. Could I have the second comment now? Nothing? Okay. Listen, folks, this is what the book of Exodus is all about. It's going to be pretty fun to study the book of Exodus. Because God is going to set some people free in this room. And I hope it's you. Let's pray. Father, thank you for your truth that you desire freedom for us, real freedom, not just in theory, not just on the pages of the Bible, but real freedom that causes us to walk in a way that fulfills the threat we are to our captors. Father, we want to glorify you in our lives and through our lives. And so, Lord, I pray that you will work in every life that studies with us in this room and online and in days to come. Father, would you work in their lives to give them that desire, that focus, that motivation to be free in you. And then, Lord, would you lead them into that freedom, I pray, in the holy and precious name of Jesus. Amen. Next week, you get to meet Moses. Actually, no, we kind of meet Moses, but more importantly, we meet his mother. Wait till you meet his mom. Whoa, what a woman. We're going to talk about Jochebed. Jochebed, Moses' mother. Next week, don't miss it. Talk to you then. Go away. On behalf of Dan Hurst and the Open Class, we want to thank you for watching. We hope it was a blessing.